and was really interested and I really liked it. So um, my session for today will be around teams governance and how we can use automation to fill gaps in the native Microsoft technology. So Microsoft have a huge amount of tools available to us to govern teams and manage this beast. But a lot of it requires configuration and manual efforts. So how do we bring automation skills into that and improve it? So first, a little bit about me. Um, I work at a company called Ergo Group based in Ireland. We are a Microsoft partner, MSP, CSP. Um, we have a wide range of customers from SMBs to enterprise, global enterprise customers. Um, there I'm the modern workplace practice lead. So my team deal directly with our customers, giving consultancy around all aspects of modern workplace. Um, I've been specializing in Microsoft technology for about 10 years now. Um, and my work, as you can tell from the title, does focus on Microsoft 365 and specifically cloud security, because a lot of the times what we'll find is enabling services is, is mm -hmm. quite straightforward, right? But it's how you scale and how you secure that that becomes the challenge. And that's why you need you need those consultants who have been through that. Um, because we deal with multiple large organizations, we have to use automation. We don't have um, the benefit of doing tasks manually at that scale. Um, and as was mentioned, um, I blog pretty much daily. Um, my blog address is there. and I'll update contact details at the end of the session. And um, then just for anyone, I don't have a development background. I come from an infrastructure background. Microsoft 365 then came from that. Um, you'll see I use PowerShell a lot and I use the different tools. Um, but not a distinct background in development. So high level of what I want to get through today with you guys is have a look at what the tools are from Microsoft that are available for us to help govern teams, help secure that user experience. Um, how do we get started with automating this mm -hmm. stuff? Can we walk through an example of a process that I've put together over the last few weeks? Um, it's quite a straightforward process, but you'll see as we go through it, there's a lot of room for expansion there and creative, as I said, creative thinking and solving solutions for your organization. We'll do a live walkthrough of that, and then we'll have hopefully some time at the end there for a Q&A. Okay, so what's the challenge with Microsoft Teams? Because um, people want it, right? It's, it's not hard to sell. Um, it's an amazing tool of collaboration. It's a game changer for a lot of companies, especially over the last year, year and a half nearly now, where there's a lot of working from home. So there's a lot of focus on that um, meetings, collaboration, all that remote work stuff that Teams does so well. Um, but because Teams does it so well, and because Teams is so easy to use, we end up in a situation that we had with SharePoint previously, right, where we've got Sprawl. And uh, Sprawl is a real problem for a lot of large organizations out of the box teams and group creation is really easy for users. They can just go in and request a new team. Um, I speak to customers mm -hmm. to this week that they've actually got more teams or more Office 365 groups than they do users. And there can't be a need for that. And they don't know where their data is. So some of the questions that people ask me is, where does my data live? Like, is it in Teams? Is it in SharePoint? What kind of data? Who can access it? Is this secure? So these types of things, as teams kind of like a train just goes, it adopts across our business. We got to find a way that we can manage that uh, that growth, not stop it, as you'll see. Um, but we need to be able to provide the correct governance and security on it. And it's important that we, when we do that, that we don't become a blocker for the business because then you get people using shadow IT and all different types of products, such as Dropbox, where they, they will find a way to share. So we got to secure it without getting in their way. So looking at some of the tools available to us. Um, so obviously Teams is based on Office 365 groups. So our group tools apply to us. So we've got Office 365 group expiration. 
which is really cool. It means that groups can't hang around when they have legacy data in there. Someone needs to consciously renew that. Uh, we've got naming policies. And so we can give our groups a somewhat rigid naming convention that I'm not a big fan of, which we'll touch on as we go through this. Um, we've got e-discovery and content search, the, the standards for discovering the data in, in the organization. We've got data loss prevention policies. Good, good, but not a complete solution. Um, Microsoft Cloud App Security, which is really cool when we get into, say, um, session control policies and things like that, where we control what exactly our users can and can't do, depending on different factors. Uh, we've got retention labels and policies, which we can apply to groups or to data, which means that we can retain or delete, equally as important, delete data after it's, um, after it's passed its expiration date. We've got the compliance and security scores, which are a decent metric to show you you're going in the right direction. Um, I, I won't say that I love the compliance and security scores because in an enterprise environment, we don't just have Microsoft technologies and the compliance and security scores only measure Microsoft technologies. So we may have a massive gap on our security score, for instance, but that doesn't necessarily mean we have a massive gap in our organization because we've got, we don't have Azure MFA, we have Duo MFA, and that's not going to give us those points. So, you know, they're a good guideline. Um, access reviews and packages are pretty exciting. Now, the license, they require E5 license, and so not everybody will be able to use that. But um, being able to make access available and reviewable to different groups and different packages of uh, locations throughout Microsoft 365 is really handy. Now, some of the ones that we'll focus on today is um, sensitivity labels. Sensitivity labels as they apply to Office 365 groups is a really cool piece of functionality that I really like and something that we're going to use as part of our automation. Uh, SharePoint sharing policy, so Teams at the back end, we've got SharePoint there for all the storage. We've got to account for that. Uh, conditional access app control, so should a um, should somebody be able to download a document if they're coming from an unknown device uh, from an unknown location? Um, group creation control. So as I said, when we out of the box greenfield tenancy, anybody can create a group, anybody can create a team. It seems great in principle, but in practice, what happens is we end up with more teams than we have users and we don't know where anything is. Um, and guest invitation control. Guest users are an interesting one because it's a really cool functionality to bring in. Uh, I love how it's done, but we got to control that somewhat because we can't just have everybody that somebody wants to talk to in our directory where they can authenticate and, and get different levels of access. Um, it's as simple as somebody inviting the wrong guest to a team uh, from a com competitor, customer or something like that. That's going to cause us major headaches. All in all, together, the tools do a great job, but there's a lot of manual checking, a lot of alerting required, and a lot of overhead in IT for us to make sure that all of this is in place for every team that's created. So the first, first one that we'll focus on is preventing uh, group team creation. So it's, it's actually really easy to, in the Azure AD directory settings under group.unified, there's a value in there for group creation allowed group ID. Oh, all we need to do here is specify um, the object ID of an Azure AD group, a security group, and we can make sure that only members of that group um, will be available to create an Office 365 group or a team or a planner or whatever that they're trying to create. Now, that's the first step to stop the sprawl of teams, like everybody's creating teams and it's a big panic. But when we do this, we got to make sure that we provide them another way to get that cool collaboration experience that they've got now. Because if we just outright block it, people will find a way around and people start using shadow IT. And that's not what we want. When we talk about security, we want people to use the products that we're making available to them, but we want to make sure that they're used in the right way. 
We don't want to just block people because that's never a solution. Um, SharePoint online sharing policy. So out of the box, again, everything's kind of open. And in certain organizations, that's totally fine. I've been in educa educational organizations where they want that because all their students have personal email addresses that um, a lecturer wants to share out um, notes to. And they want to be able to share out to a Gmail account. But some of the financial organizations that I've worked with, that's a big problem because anybody can share anything at any time. Now, data loss prevention can help with this, but it's not, it's not a perfect solution. There's always risk there. So I find personally that the safest level for this is making sure that they're a guest user in the directory and we control the guest process. And if we can control the guest process, then the sharing to guests becomes uh, safe. Um, we can still implement data loss prevention and stuff like that layered on top of it, but we're 10 times better than we were. We can also limit the sharing by uh, particular domains. So we can say we only want to share with um, our partner companies and we, we list them out, or maybe we blacklist some domains if we're not as strict. Um, these are at the top level settings, but we can absolutely do that on a per site basis. And on a per site basis, you see it's it's quite easy to set it there from PowerShell, but that's when you start thinking, okay, but what about when somebody creates a new site? Do we need to have an admin to go in and, and do this automatically? Do, do we need to trigger an alert to our service desk? Or do we need to push people to the service desk to ask to, for a site to be created? And that's not gonna be a priori priority ticket for our service desk. So that's not gonna happen for a few days. Again, we're blocking people from doing it. Another cool feature in SharePoint Online is the, um, the conditional access app control. So we can, as I mentioned earlier, we can allow limited access based on not just device as it says, as it says on the in the GUI, but we can play around with the conditional access policy and we can basically through a multitude of factors define who can actually download, who can view on the web, who can access it all. Uh, and once we, once we have that idea of where the different locations, what the different risk factors are, we can feed that in. Again, it can be done on a per site level. And again, if we're doing it on a per site level, what's the overhead associated with that? So you can see sort of a team here is like, great, we can do all this stuff. It's great. But if we want to do it, that puts us in a situation where we're going to have to do this every time a team is requested and in a large organization that takes up a lot of time. So if we look at the kind of controls that we spoke about already, so we've got the guest user access, we've got the unmanaged device access, external sharing, uh, group privacy, all, all that good stuff that we want to do. One cool feature um, in Microsoft 365 is sensitivity labels. So we can actually control all of these features based on group sensitivity. Um, a little bit or completely different actually, but very close in naming to group classifications, which were available previously, which were really just a label. Whereas sensitivity labels um, actually perform tasks, configuration tasks for us when we apply them to a group. So, um, a little bit of background on sensitivity labels for anyone who's not familiar with them. They evolved from Azure Information Protection labels, which in turn evolved from rights management. And it's essentially a label that applies classification or encryption or rights management or all three or a mixture to data in our environment. And that's how they started, right? So if you've got them enabled at the moment, you'll see them in your office client where you can assign a different sensitivity or a different classification to your documents. And that's great. Um, that's great for documents. Um, we can also automatically apply these to documents um, based on things like sensitive information types, keywords, that kind of stuff. We can use them in data loss prevention policies. So we can actually say if this document is classified with this label, then we're going to stop um, this content from leaving our business through Teams or whatever. 
the protection on a document level stays with the document regardless of location. So if it's on a USB stick, that's totally fine. It's still protected. People still got to authenticate with the Microsoft server for that. But the real change last year was when this became, sensitivity labels became available to groups. It's also available to Azure Purview and Preview now. I haven't tested that. It's something that I've been, I've been wanting to test, but it does seem quite a cool feature to bring in. But Groups Insights is what we'll focus on now. So what do they do? Like if we assign a sensitivity label to a group, what happens? Well, all the stuff that we've spoke about so far with regards to configuration, that all gets applied based on the sensitivity label that we apply to a group. So um, if we look at the group privacy, so that's whether somebody can just join a group or whether they can, they have to be invited to the group. Um, guest access, so do we allow guests into our group? Or every time I say group, you can think Teams or you can think Planner or SharePoint site. Um, external sharing, so do we want to allow this, the contents of this team planner group to be shared externally? And unmanaged device access, so that's that again, that conditional access app control where we can configure who and where and when get access and what level of access. We've got a few options for assigning it, so we, we can say that there's, okay, there's a default label for all our groups, or we can create um, or we can create label policies to make them available to users. So when they create a team or a group, for instance, they have to decide what label to apply. Again, I like that, but it's it's really not solving the problem because it's just shifting the onus to the to the end user to do that. And yeah, you, you can train and educate your users, but people can make mistakes and they're not like a lot of times they're not technical people so they don't know the impact of making a mistake on creating a finance group and not applying a label that blocks external access and we've got all those guests floating around in the directory so if somebody gets invited into that they and with teams you see the whole history of the chat you get access to all the files it's it's an easy mistake to make if it's not managed correctly so for using office 365 group our sensitivity levels with Office 365 groups, there's um, a little bit of work we got to do. So the first thing we need to do is um, enable the enable MIP labels setting on the group unified directory setting. Once that's enabled, we got to run the execute Azure AD label sync command. And what that'll do is that'll start the process of groups becoming available or sensitivity labels becoming available to Office 365 groups. It's worth mentioning that there's a few other settings in here that um, are quite handy if you're interested in them. So the allowed to add guests setting if um, we're allowed to add guest groups. Um, classification list is that legacy classification that I mentioned. It's not our sensitivity labels. So I'd start phasing that out if you are using it and move to sensitivity labels for classifying groups. Um, custom block word lists and the names, thing, things like that. So we, we can kind of shape with these directory settings what um, what can be done or what way our group structure is set up through Azure AD. Another feature outside of sensitivity labels that I mentioned is the group naming policy. Now, it's fine. It provides some basic naming conventions where we've got a prefix, a suffix, and it's cool enough we can we can base it off a, an attribute of the user. So maybe the user's department becomes the prefix for it. It's it's a bit rigid for my taste. Um, while I do like it, I don't think it's as flexible as we would need it to be. Um, we can introduce block word list, words list so we we can block particular words from becoming the name of the group. So if there's a sensitive term or even just bad language in our organization, we can um, make sure that that can't be the name of a group that you just create. Well, what we can't do with naming conventions, which bothers me a little bit, is we can't differentiate between groups created for different purposes. So if we have a group that was created for Planner or a SharePoint site that was created, going to get the same naming convention 
as a team. So again, it do, it doesn't lend itself to that flexibility. So, yeah, somebody's having a good time. Um, so, and group name policies don't apply to admins, so this is just something to be aware of. Mm. If you set up a group name policy and you're a global admin and you try and create it, then um, it's not going to apply. You're not going to be forced to use it. So a group expiration policy is something I really like. You mentioned it at the start there. So we can set a lifetime for our groups and they will expire at the end of, in this case, 180 days. Before they expire, the owners of the group will get an email to say, hey, this group's about to expire. Do you want to renew it for another 180 days? And they can choose, they can choose to do that. And we, we can also specify, like if a group doesn't have an owner, we can send an email to our support desk so that we're aware of it, so that we don't lose that data. Um, with expiration policies, I really like them. I feel like there's a there's a chance that we may lose sensitive data, so we should have retention policies, all that kind of stuff in place when we're doing any sort of automated deletion, so that we retain data, even if not the group object. <clears throat> So guest user invite settings is, is another one that we mentioned. So we want to bring guests, we want that business to business collaboration in, in the organization, right? We've got partner organizations that we work with. We want to give them access to resources through whatever means. Um, having an Azure AD guest account there for that user means we can apply things like MFA. We can um, we can give them accesses to access to resources within our organization, but we got to control that a little bit, right? Because we don't want maybe a competitor organization. We don't want somebody brought in from there. Maybe we have some rules about who can be brought in. We definitely don't want um, private accounts. If we're if we're a financial organization, don't necessarily want a lot of, a lot of Gmail and Hotmail accounts sitting in their directory where they can see see different aspects of it. They can pull for different email addresses. They can be invited into teams, that kind of stuff. So another thing that we we do or I do when I initially begin with a customer is I disable this functionality for just anybody to be able to invite guests. But like the group creation, we got to provide another way to do it, right? And that's where automation can help us. Um, we also have that whitelist and blacklist functionality that we had with <clears throat> SharePoint sharing. So we can maintain, and um, if we get into the automation space, we can maintain through code the list of approved whitelisted domains that we will collaborate with, that we will send guest user invitations to. So how it all fits together then? So sensitivity labels, really good, really like them. Teams, group naming, conventions, and governance. Really like it. Paired with sensitivity labels. Really cool. And then SharePoint governance on top of that. That's even better because we're now using those multiple technologies to work off each other and benefit each other, right? So we're, co we're covering different aspects. But what does automation look like for you? So the first step, as we mentioned, is disable users' ability to create teams and Office 365 groups by default. They're not going to be happy with that. Um, I've been there. I've been in companies where they've decided, no, we've got 1,000 teams and 500 users, so we're turning off this functionality until we can get some, some handle on it. Um, but we need to provide it in a different way, or else your, our users are just going to find ways around it. They'll download Slack, they'll start using Dropbox, all that kind of stuff that we don't want them to do. Um, and the way to do it is to wrap some automation around that provisioning process. So what we're taking away, we've got to give them that functionality back through different means. The, the worst thing we can do is make it hard for users to do their job because Teams is such a collaborative tool and it, it's so easy to use. 
if we begin blocking that, then we become the bad guys in it, and then we lose faith. We lose the faith of the organization. We gotta, you know, help them. So when we're automating, uh, and you'll you'll see as I go through the demo, this is some of the tools we can use. Um, we can use Azure Automation, so we can create automation runbooks. We can use Power Apps to provide a cool front end for our users. We can use the Microsoft Graph in the back end to reach out, create, poll things, all that kind of stuff. Um, we can use Logic Apps to manage that workflow. And we can use Azure Functions. I've just realized that says Logic Apps, but <laughs> it prompts it's Azure Functions. Um, we can use Azure Functions then to provide some more autom automation. So when we're, when we're creating the solution, this is how we, we can layer it. And this isn't an, an exhaustive list. We can use all sorts of different tools here. This is just the ones that I like to use when we're when we're building a solution for this. Um, so we've got that user interface through Power, through Power Apps. We've got the, the workflow management through Logic Apps and approvals built in there too. We've got some cool scripting stuff, Azure Automation and Azure Functions. And then we interact with Microsoft 365 through, uh, through Graph. For the most part, we, we also can use PowerShell for different tasks that aren't available in Graph or may just be easier to do through PowerShell. And as you saw in, um, in Joel's presentation, we can do some pretty cool authentication using scripts and stuff like that where we don't store our credentials. And we'll, we'll see a little bit of that in the, in the demo that I've built. Um, so this is what an example solution could look like. So this is a, this is a Power App, this is the home page of a Power App where we're getting the details from a user of what exactly they want. So um, we're asking them for the team name. So what do you want to call it? Do you want it to be internal or external? Do you want it to be private or public? Um, I like to include a secondary owner whenever we're creating these because someone could leave the business or out, out sick and you know this group needs to be managed so two owners is usually the minimum i would recommend so generally if we're creating a group or a team or planner or anything like that I'll, I'll usually include a second owner as part of the prerequisites um external domain so <clears throat> if we go down the road of limiting the sharepoint side or check looking up against our whitelist for guests um, we can capture an external domain and send that for approval. So if we don't have this guest, um, the guest domain on our whitelist in Azure AD, we can actually take that, do a lookup, say, okay, we haven't approved this for access, but instead of logging a call and getting lots of people involved to review it, we just send on an approval to um, <clears throat> whoever owns that access. Um, and whoever owns that process can review and say, yeah, it's not a personal domain, it's a partner company. I'm going to approve it and then continue on with our with our flow. And then some justification. So if if um, we do require approval, it's nice to give people some um, some free text where they can just go and give a justification and let the approver know why they want it. Um, what you'll see here is and again, this is quite basic, but we can build upon this. And I think that's the that's the key to any of this is, you know, you could you can get quite quite creative. This can expand to do more than just create a team. We we can use that P, we can use PMP and we can create full site sites where we have specific designs, web parts, all that kind of stuff. Um, you'll see in this example that we're using Azure Functions to check the availability of the team name. So instead of passing that and trying to manage that through code live for the user, they can click that. It's going to send a request to Azure Functions where that will then check if the team exists. If it doesn't exist, it's going to come back and say, yeah, you're fine. Go ahead, create it. If it does exist, it's going to um, tell the user that. Maybe recommend they choose a different name, something like that. And then create a team will kick off our uh, Logic Apps flow. So let's step a little bit through that, that solution and what that looks like. So Azure Functions, so we've added this as a connection into, um, into Power Apps. So we can actually call that Azure Function directly from our Power Apps button when the user clicks it. That means when they, they have a name, they get a really quick response, reasonably quick response, I suppose, rather than really quick. 
they get a reasonably quick response from Azure Functions to say, hey, yeah, this doesn't um, this doesn't exist. You can go ahead and create, or it does exist. So you got to pick a different name. Um, <clears throat> looking at the breakdown of of the function and what we're doing when that user clicks that button, so we're taking it in as we're we're taking it in as a parameter here. Um, we are using the managed service identity to get a graph token. So we've given, and we'll see in the next slide, we've given access to the actual function to request that token directly from graph. We've given it the right permissions. We've given it um, group.read.all because that's all the app really needs at the moment. So it pulls the access token. It builds its query into, into the URI, puts a request in, and then re returns either yes, this exists, or no, this doesn't exist. And then we manage the response down in Power App. Um, well, I think a couple of the sessions today have talked about managed service identity, so I won't spend too long on them. But um, once we have the identity for our function, we can um, give it, and this is the app ID for graph, that we can actually give it the uh, right permissions on our graph, um, on the graph app. So that we don't actually need to do things like request a token uh, using a user identity or something like that. Um, what I've gone for in this, um, you know, it's more of a personal preference, but I've gone for a for because it's small scale and it's a demo, I've gone for a SharePoint tracking list. So when we actually submit our team um, request, it's gonna pop an entry onto this SharePoint tracking list. And that can be tracked right through using the, the status column, provisioning status column, right through to when it's complete. And we, we'll see that in action. We can use other things, we can use databases, we can use Dataverse. You know, it's it really depends on what scale you're going for, what exactly you'll need. But if it's a small scale, say a small company, yeah, SharePoint list is totally fine. Um, <clears throat> so that's where we get to our logic app. So what our logic app is going to do is it's going to monitor and pull that um, that SharePoint list. And to start, what's going to happen is it's going to find that there's a new entry in the in the list. And um, when the entry is detected, it's going to update the provisioning status of that um, of that entry, the line item, to start it to let us know as admins, okay, it's gotten this far, it's, it's started the provisioning, so what's next? Um, I've put in a check to see if the value for external is, is there. And if it's an external team, I'm saying, right, we're gonna send that for approval, right? Mm -hmm. um, before we continue. If it's not an external, if it's not an external team, then it's going to just go ahead and create create the internal team because we don't really care as long as the governance is applied. Um, which, so for the external team, depending on whether it's approved or not, we go down two different tracks. So if it's approved, then we go ahead and we continue on. We set the status to approved and we move on. If it's rejected, then it's set to rejected. And then what we do is we're going to let the user know, hey, this team, this team was rejected. Sorry. Um, we can include other stuff like we can feed back some, some comments from the from the approver to say, OK, here's why it was rejected. Um, we and the key here is that we can get really flexible and meet our business requirements. Um, this app that, I, that I'm going to go through, it's well, it does the job. It's it can be like this idea can be heavily customized and we've got some really flexible technology to do that. <clears throat> so if it's all approved and we're, we're happy, we're ready to go, we can just call uh, this run um, run the Azure Automation Runbook. So I've got one in there for Teams provisioning. We've got some parameters that we take in. Uh, the name is Great Team. We pass in the team name. All of this comes from the from the app. So the team name, the privacy, the owners, justification, um, whether it's external or not. And if it's external, we pass through an optional uh, external domain parameter. 
Um, all these values have been passed on to SharePoint. Um, and that's that's just kind of a handy thing to do so you have the full view of your of your um, requests start to finish. So inside of our Azure Automation Runbook, we can see that these parameters are taken in. I've set some defaults just to make it easier. Um, we take all this stuff in. I've taken it in as strings here, but yeah, you, you can change um, change to different um, types. It was just it, it was the easiest way when, when you're building a small scale solution like this for a demo. It's it's quite easy to just pass them through. Um, so another thing we Joel looked at in the previous session is um, using the managed zero identity on the Runners account to access Key Vault. So Key Vault is something you're going to see a lot of um, probably throughout all of this because um, it's so flexible and so easy to use with um, with all the different Microsoft technologies and non-Microsoft technologies, and it's nice and secure. We can save save all of our our tokens or anything that we need, certificates, you can save them all in there and access them securely. Um, so what we're doing here is we're creating the connection name. We're, we've got the modules installed, which um, the AZ Key Vault and AZ Account, which is required by Key Vault. So all of that stuff is in. And then what we do is we request um, a token from our Key Vault. So I've got a, a graph access token held in Key Vault, which I'll touch on. Um, and I've got the client ID of the application held in Kivo. So we're using, and just to, to, we'll get a bit more in detail on why exactly, but we're using delegate access for this particular script. And the reason we're using delegate access rather than application permissions is because labels, sensitivity labels, only support delegated permissions uh, through graph. You can't assign them using application permissions, so we need to use delegate permissions. Now that kind of produces a challenge the first time I did this because, okay, well then do I need to log in with a user? How do I automate that? So I've got a cool, I've got a cool little script on my blog that I touch on here that will show you that. Um, so our key vault, as you can see, is set up access token, app secret, client ID, and refresh token are in there. They're ready to ready to go. And what we've done up the top here is we've given the Teams automation account permissions. So that now I've given a full permissions, but that that was just me creating a demo lab. You can uh, narrow down the permissions you give it. If it's just secrets, you can just give it the secrets permission. Um, the run as account, which we create in the Azure in Azure Automation. Um, if you go down to run as accounts, you can create the Azure Managed Service run as account. You can also use a classic uh, run as account and give it an identity, but we don't necessarily need to do that. So, so the MSI is much much better, much more efficient. Um, so the run as account is created and granted access to key vault. You'll see the connection details there. Um, so inside of our automation runbook, we've got um, our graph query here. Yeah, we can get much more complex for what we put in here, but we um, first create an Office 365 group before we create a team. So you'll see in the body of our request here, we've got our team name, we've got our type that's unified, We've got our two owners that we're mapping in. We've got label ID, which is the GUID of the sensitivity label that we've created. Um, we've got mail nickname, which is just our team name. Uh, we've got our privacy variable, which um, will tell us if it's a internal or if it's a private or public team. Um, I've got some error, error right for both here, just so I can track it. And then we send a request off, and that will create the Office 365 group for us. Um, then, once we have the group created, we create a team based on that group. So we use a put request. We've got our uh, API URI here, and in our body, we just have some team specific settings about what, what can be done inside that team. We pass that through. Put in a sleep command here because something I noticed. 
and um, it's probably not going to change, is the script was running too fast for the team to actually be created. It took about five seconds for that to actually show up for me to look it up and I was getting there. So I just like to give it a little bit of time to breathe, get that, get that group set up before we can convert it to a team. Um, on the delegated access uh, token. So not really the purpose of this session, but let's um, just to show you guys what how I'm maintaining that token. Um, I keep it live by using uh, Azure um, Azure Automation Runbook that's scheduled to run every so often that uses the refresh token from our access token to generate a new one. So if, if you're unfamiliar with the access tokens for Graph, you get an access token that lasts for an hour, and after that, your access token is gone. But you've got a refresh token as part of that object that you can renew your access token using that. So what happens in this script here is we actually connect to Key Vault. We pull our refresh token from Key Vault. Um, we pull the app secret. We pull the client ID and I've hard coded the tenant ID, but yeah, we could pull that too. Um, we get our scope. So what's the actual access that's granted to this? What are we going to be using? What do we require in the token? Uh, I've got this fix up just to fix the formatting on the scope. Um, and then what we do is we request the token from this endpoint using all those details. And this is up in my blog and I can share this, um, share this slide deck as well. Um, but we get the refreshed access token by calling using the refresh token. We get that new token, which we then write out the key vault as the refresh token and access token. So we've refreshed our access token and then we're writing back, here's our new access token, here's our new refresh token. So it kind of keeps that, that delegated access live. So uh, yeah, let's with that, let's jump into a quick demo walkthrough of the of the tool. Uh, so let me just pull this up. So what well, what we got here is that power app that I um that I touched on in the in the slide deck. So I'm just gonna give it a refresh because it was open for you know for a little while. We're gonna request a new team. So uh, let's call it Automate. And we want uh, an external no, let's go internal team for now. Uh, we want private or public. We want yeah, private's fine. We want to give a secondary owner. Uh, look up our user and select it. We got this check availability, so that's going to run our function. And it usually takes about ten seconds. So got no errors, and we can now create team. And go ahead and create that. We're going to hop over here. This is our back end SharePoint list. So we see a new internal team. Uh, internal team automate is there. So on our logic app, we're polling every five minutes for this. So I'm just going to run it now uh, just so we don't need to wait. Cool. And it's, it's already complete. So to look at our logic app, we can see internal team automate came in. Cool. Updated the tracker. Sweet. Um, does it require approval? Well, it's not external, so no, we didn't require approval. So it went here. So the tracker was updated to approved. The automation job was set. And then after the automation job run, we completed the setup. So now, depending on how quick this is, if I refresh teams.
No, it's not done just yet. Let's just check our. Oh, our job is running. The internal team automate. Completed. Oh, there we go. We got our team. Now, we go back here. Oh, uh, let's say a second user comes in. I also want this team. Did I spell that right? Internal team automate. That's weird. That should give me an error. And just refresh the app. Hmm. Well, it was working perfectly fine until I tried to demo it. No, well, trust me, <laughs> that should work. Uh, okay, so if we look then at our external, so if someone wants to request an external team, they get some more options here. We want to be private, we can say Adele is the owner. Check availability. I create. So our team is being queued for provisioning. If we look at our logic cap now, so we should see an entry here. Panel team. I'm going to just kick off the logic cap so we're not waiting. Cool. So we should have. Approval waiting for us. So let's approve it. And we see it's check the approval response. It was approved. It's run our runbook. We go to our runbook. Refresh. It's running. We give it a minute to run. It's going to create that external team and then it's going to do different things based on what attributes we've passed through and what we've told it to do. So we can lock um, we can lock down the team. So for the internal team, what we'll see. As you know, who's your So on the <clears throat> on the internal team, what we'll see is that label that we applied. Uh, under groups. Activity label. Under the map for a second. Let's see, is there external one in? Hi, Sean. Uh, would you be able to increase the result, like in a resolution of your window? So just go for that. Yeah, that's perfect. Fantastic. Thank you. No problem. Uh, external team is created. We can see external team has been given our, <coughs> excuse me, our sensitivity level. 
so that was automatically provisioned as part of the, the graph request. Now we can do other things. We can set um, set different features. We can tie in um, PMP or we can site designs, all that kind of stuff. The, the benefit of this is that we can kind of get really creative and do whatever we want with it as long as we can programmatically do it, which is pretty much most things in Microsoft 365. Uh, I think the last blocker we have is one to one chat that I think is still not available, but that's the only thing I've run through run into so far with this kind of solution. So we can see uh, this was completed. We can see the stuff that went through to it. And we can see that if we go to teams now, we're a member of external team. And that team has got the, the right sensitivity label applied because it's pulled it uh, directly. So just to hop back then to our presentation. So <coughs> just to summarize then, um, with these tools, you can really build your own solution with it. What I, what I advise is look at Microsoft 365 security and governance as one holistic thing, not as separate aspects of it. A lot of the times I'll talk to customers and they're really interested in a specific security feature. And that's totally fine, but that security feature works so much better when you when you look at the whole instead of that individual piece. Um, don't get in the user's way because they'll find ways around it and you'll just be the bad guy down. It's hard to sell anything. Um, be creative with the problem solving. So what you've seen a quick glimpse of here is that we can kind of come up with these solutions and use the different tools available to us to get what we need done done. Um, you know, you can be as creative as you want. Tools are really flexible. Um, help provide the users with a good experience. So um, one of the things you'll see with the Power App, it's got a nice Teams background. It's it's user friendly ish for something that didn't work for parts of the demo, but uh, trust me, in production, it is a lot better. Um, give the user something nice to to uh, interact with because that's going to sell for you as well. Um, and always consider as part of any of these rollouts, user training and change management. Help them to understand why restrictions or why they got to do certain things instead of the way they used to do it, because that's going to that's kind of half the battle for you when uh, when you're trying to get users to kind of change the way the way they work. Um, other just thoughts is look at expanding out on this idea because it is as flexible and it's only limited by what you can think think about to implement. Um, look at PMP for SharePoint site designs. Look at Planner, for instance. Um, you can do some cool things with, with Planner with this where um, you'll see I have one post on my blog that shows we can pull all the secure score entries right into Planner so you can assign them out to, to different members of the team. Um, look at the Microsoft Graph. It's really flexible. It's quite fun, fun to work with when you start finding the different aspects that you can control. Um, and with that, I'm going to just open up the questions. I've, um, that's the, my blog and my Twitter and LinkedIn contact details there for you as well. Um, I will post them into the chat when the session is finished. Thank you for that, Sean. Fantastic. Highly relevant uh, session. That's, that's going to help a lot of people there. Um, there is a question by Idris Nouri, who's asking, who would be the primary owner? Um, mm -hmm. So um, who would be yeah. the primary owner? The primary owner is whoever requests the team as part of that app. But um, what we've done in the past for different customers is we've said um, the user's manager becomes an owner. Um, and depending on, say, you can ask them what department they're in and maybe set that department head as an owner. Um, it's really down to what the business requirements are. Um, you can be really flexible on it. <clears throat> and he follows up by asking, um, can you add members from form like you added secondary owner? Yes, yeah, you ab absolutely can. So <clears throat> one thing to know, like um, the solution that I've demoed here is just something I've built for this demo. Um, 
you can customize it as much as you like. So you can add in separate pages. You can get really complex with it if you like. Um, you can add a member picker, that kind of stuff. Generally, one, once you're an owner, you can add people to the team anyway. So it's maybe going a little bit over the top to add a whole part of the app for that. But yeah, the answer is yes. And the final part of the question is, if you don't click check for availability and go straight to create teams, will create team button check for availability and create the team if the name is available? So that's actually the issue that I ran into, that but the create team button should not appear until you've checked availability. So that's um, the demo gods were against me. Awesome. Uh, lots of great feedback there. Um, saying thanks, great session, um, great detailed coverage of governance and power, powerful demo. So it's a really good demo, hands on. Everyone loves those demos. Um, so I think uh, it went down very, very well, Sean. Um, so Sean, you've um, could you um, thanks for sharing your your details there. Could you also share them in the chat window as well, please? Absolutely. Fantastic, Sean. So I was actually excited to. Uh, see you in action today sean um so i'm really glad we all got a chance to see you today in action i'm sure we'll see lots more of you in the future sean yeah thanks a lot for um for the invite fantastic that was sean sean mcavenue so that does sound like a rock star name sean i have to say it does sound like a band i'm surprised you pronounce it right even people in Ireland can't pronounce that right Awesome. That was Sean. That was Sean. Fantastic. It was great to see Sean. A great session. Um, everyone is using Teams um, in all the scenarios. It's a new, uh, it's a new way of using collaboration for for SharePoint. So it's very very important. Um, and uh, Sean has shown you how to leverage on that and set that up correctly. So, um, so again, um, so that was that. Uh, we are going to move over to the next session while uh, Sean shares his uh, 